these colors are really incredible. Yeah. It's really materialized. It's very, it's like a real brilliant. It's a real abstract form of yeah. painting. Thank you, Marion, for uh, having me here uh, at your museum for a conversation between us. And I hope we can have a fruitful uh, conversation about uh, what is going on um, in this moment in history in connection with um, history of art and, and contemporary art. So uh, since we are here in front of one of the most legendary uh, post-war paintings uh, that has been produced uh, in the history um, of, of humankind, production of art, I would like to point out on how the triptych, the war by uh, Otto Dix, uh, is one of the most important examples of uh, our artist's work, which is observing the reality and creating narratives that go against uh, forms of uh, the propaganda. So my first question is, what's your position uh, about this? Yes, yeah, so thank you, Alessandro, for uh, first, firstly for being so much um, interested in these contemporary relevance um, of this painting of Otto Dix, but also our collections. Um, it is so good when we when we understand that contemporary artists really refer to this important part of history of art and think it it is relevant for our times and can help us and society. Before I try to answer to your question what museums in general can contribute to this situation um, and how they can bring uh, audiences uh, to uh, be more critical um, towards uh, ideology and all the things of manipulation which are going on, I would perhaps um, refer to this painting and analyze um, what uh, makes it so helpful when you engage as a museum with your audience. So you don't need any comment, you don't need any form of interpretation. It is so strong, standing as a single visitor in front of this painting, and, and you can see with your own eyes what, what war means. So you don't have to trust anymore any heroic narrations. You can see that that there are people dissolving um, into, into the doom. You, it is mainly an abstract painting. When you, when you look at the middle part and you see the paint, and the artists try to, to depict the, the wounded people, the bodies, the flesh, um, and, he, and he uses it all kind of shades of red and gray and black and white. And, um, the bodies are dissolving, there are no humans anymore, uh, and the corpses are torn into pieces. And then um, you see these uh, sleeping people in the predella. You don't know if they're sleeping or if they're dead, but it's like a cycle of that it, it starts from the beginning again and again, so war is repeating. And so looking at this painting as an example, it lets you resist against any forms of people telling you that wars are necessary. And you know, this generation of artists at the beginning, 1914, they believed in their effect of catharsis through war, through a world war. And then after one year, one and a half years, uh, it changed totally and they understood. Um, and so it is a very important warning. So second part of your question, what does it mean for today, for, for the museums? How can we work through our collections and through our tools to give the people accessibility to our museums and collections. Everybody uh, make it accessible to, to let them see our works. Um, if, you, if you are in a certain moment of history, um, you could always change the time. You can go back to another moment of history or to another century and, and show people that things are repeating, how you can learn from it. For example, I spoke for some, um, some days ago to my colleague Suhania Raphael from Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And I asked her, 
how she can work with her new museum and plus in a political way uh, against this system, which is very, has censorship and so. And she said, I can go back to another century, for example, uh, speaking about the tradition of Chinese art. I could work with artworks themselves, like um, including Duchamp in our program and show the people what radical art means against any forms of ideology. And speaking through, the, through art, um, they have, there are so many ways of um, using um, art to, to be political in this moment. Yeah, that's really um, on point, I guess. And I, um, I would like to, to build on what you said about this um, merging relationship that is going on in this triptych where uh, the bodies and flesh seems to um, merge with the hurt. And it reminds me how, it's like a metaphor on how we are so strongly connected with, with the reality around us. We, we cannot really disconnect from this. And also the fact that this uh, artist, he's embodying in this work so many uh, techniques from very realistic, very objectual, uh, going to very abstract, where the flesh is completely merged and uh, with the hurt. And I think that this painting, this uh, triptych embodies all the uh, experience that uh, Otto Dix has been working on uh, his entire life and uh, where there are all the elements here, including the uh, shelf-shaped uh, holes on the ground and uh, the trenches all over the landscape, the masks. So it's incredible how artists don't come up with one idea uh, at some point, but it's a building over, uh, over the years. So what I'm, uh, I'm telling this because the approach that artists use uh, is um, it's really uh, organic. So they, it, it, their relation and interpretation of the reality is something that is really important because it's built over the years. It's a constant and, um, and consistent observation and dedication. So it's political because the reality matters to the artist. And this is expressed through their practice. You see their previous production that is investigated separately, uh, in the case of Otto Dix, in different etchings that forms these 50 uh, amazing uh, drawings and uh, etches, all of a sudden becoming the one experience in, in this painting. And I think that while the first 50 etchings was more his immediate reaction to his personal experience as a machine gunner during the, the First World War. This one is um, interesting as well because it's somehow um, telling that something new is going on because this happened year after the, the First World War, anticipating the Second World War in a moment in, in the history of uh, of Europe and, and, and Germany uh, in particular where the propaganda was really, really uh, rising up. So um, my um, uh, other question that I'm, I'm very curious to know is um, a lot of contemporary artists today still work in this way. So heading in their work a level of truth that is aiming at understanding it uh, at its core because the, especially now with this, all this disconnection and polarization that has emerged after these years of divisive politics um, and political visions. So truth um, is important to rebuild connection. So my question is how uh, do you envision the work of a collection in um, talking about reconciliation and uh, reconnection with the uh, people, how, how you envision your work has uh, healing after all this, uh, you know, hate and, uh, and polarization. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a 
very important question. So um, uh, speaking about healing, uh, you know that in the ethnographic collection, um, we have many works from um, other cultures um, and, and also other centuries where you really have healing models for healing practices. So for, for example, in indigenous cultures, there was a ritual uh, sitting on a, on a piece of fabric on the ground floor, uh, and then you could uh, go through a process of healing. We have uh, in some weeks an exhibition. It's about the loss of language through tra traumatic experiences, so uh, wordlessness, um, and how you can overcome um, these terrible uh, personal and visual experiences through the arts. Uh, and we exhibit also, of course, these ethnographic pieces. But on the other hand, we, we want to come back to um, the um, importance um, of art itself. It also means literature, Paul Zela, and, um, um, and art in general. Why, um, why art, and in which way art can, can help us to overcome these um, terrible um, experiences, also of whole societies, um, which lead to a, less, uh, to a loss of language. Um, and uh, we are um, referring to the Shoah, um, or we are also referring to the conflict between um, Western and Eastern Germany, and, and as the people still feel um, depressed and um, so I would say our whole program, the whole work in our museum is about um, bringing people to find ways of reconciliation to, um, through uh, having possibilities to, regard, to discuss with other people, to, to look at art and uh, uh, have the time to, to reflect upon that. Um, yeah, also to feel something like a comfort because you feel you're not alone. You're not alone. It's, it's also um, a, a something you can work with empathy um, and doing something against loneliness. Yeah. And building a community. Yes, yes. That's um, really fascinating. <laughs> so, you know, I, and I wish you good luck with all these projects. One point that I, I, I consider really uh, intriguing about mm, the contemporary art in general, and that's why you know, I'm, I'm choosing to work uh, with a contemporary artists, even though I, mm, I believe that there is not a real concrete and precise um, uh, role of art, its contribution to history uh, has been crucial. And in this moment in history where um, so much is going on in terms of, especially in the European zone, uh, where um, after years of the Brexit, uh, all this idea of united Europe is, is becoming a sort of utopia and not so realistic as we have thought at, at the very beginning. So the contribution of uh, trying to um, build up on what are the challenges of, of this moment. And that's what uh, Autodix uh, has done, contributing to the development of an understanding of the history of the time and um, doing it through a language that was really uh, connected to the um, German culture because you know he is a obvious observer of for example Grunewald and uh, uh, like um, and um, and he saw you know the um, Colmar uh, crucifixions so where all these great bodies are coming from what do you think that is the challenge that artists are doing? So in particular in the European zone, of course, but in general, so what's their challenge um, in this time and how museum can help them? Mm -hmm. um, I, believe, um, I believe in art and I believe in the power of contemporary artists um, to always find um, their themes and um, and, and especially under difficult con conditions. Um, if you look back in history, um, you always also found very good art which evolved from these situations. So um, 
I, I would say um, it will be important that artists can travel again. So because you need your eyes, you have to see the world. So Otto Dix, when, when, uh, when he was in Dresden for the first time in uh, 1910 to 1914, he went through all our collections. He was so many hours in the Old Masters Gallery. He looked at the painting from the backside. He looked how it was done, the frame. Every, every painting, every work of him is also built like a sculpture. Um, so, and then, uh, of course, we spoke about that already. He was, uh, as a soldier, um, in the war, and he was drawing all the time and also um, documenting what he was seeing through his own eyes. So, like Goya, Iolo Visto is a, is a person who was there, and he was uh, um, documenting what he personally had seen. And then um, there was uh, the next part when he worked after the photographs of the wounded uh, soldiers and then the edges, uh, the 50 edges on, on war were made by him in the 20, early 20s. And then he made these two triptychs. <clears throat> and as you said, this was um, the idea to make really a main opera which is about truth. So like Wolfgang Tillmann's truth studies, yeah, what is truth? And when you bring it back to our times, the contemporary times, uh, I would say having the possibility to, to, to see the world, to travel, to, to be, of course, very critical with all the media. Um, and then on the other, other hand, I would say uh, the real danger for artists uh, is no, not so much the social factors about what we talk all the time. It's more about censorship. Um, when you, when you uh, see what at the moment worldwide and how many countries of the world there's censorship against artists and there's danger for their life, um, um, I would say this is the real danger. And um, uh, so we have to, to help um, the artist on, on this level. But um, I have a strong trust that um, the artists will find their ways to, to, um, to react on, on our times with all the different possibilities. They, they can, of course, do something like agit prop, yeah, and very directly do something like a political <laughs> uh, comment, uh, a rapid response to our daily politics. But on the other hand, uh, also Gerhard Richter, who is um, in, in his age um, drawing every time, every day, continuing to draw, and he's really at the moment creating great, great artworks. Um, it's not political in the literally sense of words, but he's, he's fighting against the time and, and continuing. He's showing that art survive also in a pandemic and in a lockdown. Alessandra, I would like to ask you something. Um, what is really very difficult for us from the perspective of the museum um, is um, how to communicate with our audiences about this complexity of art. So when we, we speak about this triptych of Otto Dix, and you need so much time. You need, it's not possible to understand it in one second. So you need, you need time. It is a triptych, so it is very pathetic. And there's also space in front of the painting. It's also a poetic, symbolic language. And what kind of your language can we use to, to bring the content to our audiences? Do you believe in the new forms of communication, social media, and so on? Can we, can we use this? Or how can we find the possibility to transfer this power of art through other forms of languages? That's a beautiful question. And I thank you for asking it. Um, of course, social media has its role in making the message uh, spreading um, far and wider. And it is definitely challenging considering how social media has been used uh, for the opposite purpose of providing tools to deliver specific languages and most of these languages, unfortunately, has been used for um, creating more confusions rather than clarity. And at some point, these languages that has been challenged um, through social media has been used also to create aid and uh, disconnection. Um, however, I, I believe that 
uh, one of the most important things that we can focus on is the uh, independence of the aesthetic, which means that artists develop their ways of visualizing their ideas. They do that through specific approaches in their practice, through colors, through materials, and uh, sometimes the story of this, the decision why artists select specific colors, why they select specific materials, is a, an interesting story, and, and people like that. Because I believe that art is not something that you necessarily have to use to put pressure on, on people. Art is a device that you can just simply enjoy and is a, uh, that helps you through your time and, and, and through also your doubts to approach the uh, realities and truth that these artworks are talking about. So I believe that uh, one very powerful form of helping audience to engage with uh, contemporary art in particular is just genuinely telling them um, how artists arrive there without necessarily using art as a metaphor, without n n necessarily thinking that art should have a specific purpose. Um, also, because artists produce without necessarily knowing what they are doing, and the, this triptych is actually a good example, because this is the final result of years and years of investigation. So uh, Autodix realized that after years of uh, experiments, failures, private experience, personal experience, collective experiences. And our role is to uh, do with uh, contemporary artists the same thing that we have been doing with historical artists, inviting people to their work, to their practices, to their ideas. And I believe that a genuine and sincere language can help uh, to deliver the message. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, thank you for this very intense answer. So I, I have another question uh, referring to time. So I grew up with the sentence, art should be made for eternity. And then on the other hand, you had this agate prop, this immediate reaction to the political daily life. And we spoke a lot about these, uh, that Otto Dix tried to make um, a main work of truth. So, and truth means that um, it, is, uh, it has a value which is independent from different times of, in history, but should also perhaps in 200, 300 years, um, a work of art which can tell the people something. Um, we, we use in German the term Überzeitlichkeit. So is, is, should art be independent from, from time? So last for a very long time, and would you still use the word eternity? <laughs> or on the other hand, we have so many forms of contemporary art, um, which are um, uh, only dedicated to the moment, or they, the artists use very often in our century a material which is not surviving for a very long time, and it's also meant to, to dissolve after a certain period of time again. We will have in this space, in the Albertinum, in some weeks, an exhibition um, of the works of art from the collection of Erika Hoffmann. The title is Still Alive, after on Kavara, uh, and it's especially about these in a way, you can say anti-museal discourse of uh, that contemporary art should not be meant for eternity. It should be really be. Um, it's it's not good if society wants to put everything in a museum and keep it and conserve it. So, how, what is your opinion to that? Um, what is eternal is the principles on which artists build their work. And um, the principles of um, empathy, uh, the principles of um, being um, aware of where we are and what is going on around us. The 
necessity to have a healthy and sincere access to facts. It is not something temporal, this is eternal. And when you have, in the case of Autodix, a human being first before an artist going into war and risking his life to principles that sometimes are not the kind of principles that you really have to fight. I believe that this person, uh, Otto Dix in particular, again, is um, creating, uh, has created something aiming at um, driving the people to understand uh, exactly which principles we have to look at. And there are moments in history in which artists use languages that are more attached to the reality, where we can see them and we can recognize them. There are moments in history where the political and social conditions push artists to work in, in, toward that direction rather than another. Just if you, and for example, we take the example of the expressionists versus you know, the uh, critical realism uh, artists. What is eternal though, and what makes them to be part of, of, mm, of, of the same context is their need to um, offer languages that unite people, that bring them to some principles that is uh, the truth, that mm, love, healing, compassion, and, and community. So art is, is eternal in, in the sense that we can still look at something coming from the past and recognize things that are present uh, today. In the same way as Autodix has looked at the Grunewald altar in, in Colmar, which was a production that was previous to him, and where he saw in, in that colors and shapes the same colors and shapes that he needed to deliver specific messages. Eternity is the principles that we are uh, looking at, and probably the uh, temporality is defined by uh, the languages, which is what define an artist practice uh, from another. Yes, thank you so much, <laughs> Alessandro. <laughs> Perhaps we can have a look at the painting yeah, again. Yeah. Yeah, what distracts me is the craters on the soil, the acid colors that, you know, it's really, you know, like a summary of German production in history. And if you remove all the human elements, this is a completely like a landscape that is depicting what is going on in the climate change in this moment. Yeah. The meaning it is eternal, you know, you know, it's how we ended up to destroying our Europe in this way. Mm -hmm.